so much for choosing to be here today. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week on Facebook at Battle Creek Nazarene. We believe that God has something unique for you today, and we hope that his love is stronger today than ever before. This morning I'd like to read for you the scripture Psalm 33, verses 1 through 8. And this morning I pray that these would be the words that, that guide us this morning as we worship the Lord our God. For that is why we are all here this morning, to worship him with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. The word of the Lord says this, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. I will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Would you please stand with us as we continue to worship the Lord this 
noticing God and noticing what God is up to around us, what God is doing in us, and what God is doing through us. Uh, what a great reminder. This week as we get started, um, I want to fast forward past the life of Jesus. So every week in, the, in this sermon series, we're looking at a, a story from the life of Jesus and kind of deducing some, uh, some elements of the spiritual practice. But I want to fast forward past that, and then eventually we'll go backwards to a story of the life of Jesus. So this is kind of my big, uh, I don't know, Christopher Nolan movie type thing where I'm jumping around time, inception sermon type thing, whatever I don't know. Uh, But 30 years after Jesus had died and been resurrected, after the crucifixion and resurrection, 30 years forward, so in like the year 63, 65 AD, as the context of our, our story. Now this is an important story from the history of Israel, but you won't find it directly in the Bible. It wasn't recorded as in one of the books. So some of what I'm going to be telling you will come from history books, specifically uh, a Jewish historian uh, named Josephus. Have anybody ever heard of Josephus? Yep. Yep, yep. So a lot of his uh, writings is, is what, why we know what we know about Israel in the time of Jesus. He was a historian, he was Jewish, but he kind of joined the Roman side of things, which is probably why his, his histories live on. Um, but he's a prolific historian from this time period. Now, today we're going to talk about something called the Siege of Jerusalem. Uh, this, that's what history remembers as, the Siege of Jerusalem. To set the context, you obviously know if you've been around the church for a while, if you were here at Christmas time, we talked about the hope for a Messiah. That God was going to send a king, send an anointed one, the good shepherd, send the Savior to come. And this hope existed before Jesus for a long time, a couple hundreds of years. Things had gotten really bad in Israel. They were constantly getting beat up by other countries and other empires, and they were really wanting God to send their leader, their Messiah, the Anointed One, to come and rescue them and reestablish uh, a monarchy, kind of like what David had, and, and, and set things right, right? So there was this hope. And then Jesus shows up, and they reject him. He wasn't quite the Messiah. Some people follow, but overall, it's like not the kind of Messiah they were looking for. Um, and so here we are, 30 years after Jesus, and there's still people looking for this anointed one, still looking for this Messiah. And there's been several, if you look in the history of Israel, there's several what they call false messiahs. They're false messiahs because their, their movements obviously failed. And so there's still this messianic hope, this, this desire for somebody to come, anointed by God, sent by God, to deliver them from oppression and, and rule from this foreign power. So that's what they thought God was going to do for them. Now Jesus, we know this, taught to love your enemies, right? One of his harder teachings, love your enemies. But there was a whole lot of people in these years after Jesus, a whole lot of people that wanted to hurt their enemies. There's a whole lot of people that thought killing their enemies was the way forward. That God would bless that somehow, that this is the fulfillment of God's promises. We're going to attack our enemies, we're going to hurt them, we're going to kill them, and through that, God's promises were going to come true. We would become Israel again, we'd have our freedom and our independence and all of that by declaring war and killing and attacking our enemies. So around the year 65 AD, 63, 64, 65 AD, Israel went to war with Rome. Now this was a really bad idea for a lot of reasons, but <clears throat> there are some reasons why they thought this was a good idea. So number one, Rome, despite being this massive world empire, only had a few people, military people, in Israel. At any given time, they probably had a thousand soldiers in the whole country of Israel. You see, Israel wasn't really that big of a deal. Now, to Israel, Israel was a big deal, but to the Roman Empire, they had bigger fish to fry. And so their solution wasn't a standing army. It was like, we'll put the governor in, we'll put a king over, we'll make sure that the religious leaders are, are pledging their allegiance to Caesar, right? And we'll make sure that everything kind of is their structure is governed, but we don't need armies there. We don't need, so they only had like a thousand soldiers there. It was a really minimal military presence. So maybe Israel looked around, the people in Israel looked around and said, well, look, we could take these guys. Um, and so maybe that's where they got the idea that war would be a good thing. Uh, they also thought God was on their side, right? So there's the chosen people. Right? God wouldn't let us lose, right? We, we, we have God on our side. We have righteousness on our side. We have, you know, the will of God, the promises of God, the blessings of God, obviously, we're going we're gonna to do this. But they reached a point in the, the mid-60s, again, about 30 years after Jesus, they reached a point where Rome had had enough of this nonsense. All the war, little infighting, the, 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 
mean, again, Israel is, is small compared to the Roman Empire, right? Um, and so Rome had enough, and they sent 80,000 skilled troops to Israel. They increased their military presence from 1,000 in the whole country to 80,000, and they sent them to Jerusalem. Now, this happened around the time of Passover. And if you're familiar with Passover, you know that uh, the Jewish folks would come and they would do a pilgrimage into the city of Jerusalem and celebrate, observe the Passover for, for days. They'd do all the ritual stuff, the meals, and all that type of thing. And so during the course of Passover week, the city filled with up to a million people. And the Roman soldiers, all 80,000 of them, were also kind of around. Now what they did was the Roman soldiers, they let the worshipers into the city. They didn't bar them, they didn't create conflict, they let them into the city, but then they never let them out. So once the city was filled up with all these people who come on pilgrimage to worship, uh, to celebrate, to observe Passover, Rome declared war on the city of Jerusalem. It was under siege for four months. The walls and the buildings were absolutely decimated during these four months. Right? Um, it was destruction beyond what you could even imagine, right? So the, by the year 70 AD, so this wasn't like a quick one and done things. The siege lasted for four months, but then kind of just lingered on and on and on, and the fighting and back and forth, and whatever. Uh, by the year 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. And basically that was it. Like Israel, Jerusalem was done. It was a pile of rocks that was just been brought to the ground. Uh, there's some descriptions, again, Josephus describes it kind of as hell on earth, destruction beyond what you could even imagine. Fire and death and broken and just chaos and destruction beyond what you can imagine. Again, there was all, a million people in the city when it started. Now the man who led the Roman siege was a man named uh, Titus, General Titus. Eventually he becomes Emperor Titus, but he was general and was in charge of the siege. And if you go to Rome today, you'll see um, there's an arch of Titus uh, was, uh, put up in the year 81 AD, and it still stands to this day. You can go and check it out. And on that archway, there's all these different images that depict Titus's uh, massive defeat over Israel. And one of the images is the plundering of the temple, carrying out a menorah and some other holy items out of the temple. This was a sign of the great victory, the spoils of war, Titus's victory over these rebellious uh, Jewish people. Titus then, after this, the temple came down and the city of Jerusalem was in ruins and, and basically everything had been lost and all these people had died, Titus, through a translator, decided to address about 100,000 people that were still left. And so this is basically what he said to the people left in Israel. He said, I hope you are satisfied with how utterly destroyed your country is now. You had no idea how great Rome's power was, nor how weak you were. And like madmen, you have brought your city, your people, and your temple to destruction. He thought this was a good idea, but I did not want it, nor do I want it to continue. So if you surrender, quit fighting, I will spare your lives. Now history records that 97,000 people surrendered to Titus. 97,000 people surrendered to Titus. Uh, and they were imprisoned and enslaved, and many of them were moved to Rome and were forced to, to perform slave labor. In fact, history records that the Colosseum in Rome, that fancy, that wonder of the world, uh, was built in great part to the slave labor of the Jewish people um, that came from Israel. Now, like I said, you won't find this in scriptures. This, this isn't recorded in the Gospels directly. This isn't recorded in the writings of Paul or any of the apostles. But many scholars believe that the Gospel of Mark uh, was written around the same time that the temple came down. And so if you're aware of it, as you read through the Gospel of Mark, you can pick up on some of the temple language and some of the apocalyptic language that, you know, doom is going to happen. But the people of God thought God was on their side, that 
because God was on their side, that their behaviors wouldn't have these consequences. They thought they could engage in the world with worldly ways, and it was going to be fine. It was going to work out for them because they were the chosen people. But the truth is their ways led directly to the destruction of their temple, their city, and their own lives. Now, Rome was to blame for its brutal behavior. This is, I'm not excusing that. Titus was a brutal guy. The Caesars have a history of being uh, remembered as being brutal leaders. Uh, Rome was a violent, violent empire. I mean, the, the crucifixion, uh, Jesus was not the only one crucified. They didn't invent it for Jesus. This was a Roman me means of torture uh, meant to inflict the most painful suffering possible to deter people from rebelling against the empire of Rome. Uh, so, not making excuses for Rome, but the, the, the Jewish people experienced death and destruction on a scale that is hard to imagine, in part because they embraced the ways and the values of the kingdom of this world, rather than the ways and the values of the kingdom of God. Now, the question at this point might become, you might be thinking, I know this was my thought as I was reading through this historical record, um, if only there had been a good shepherd that would have led the people on a different path. A path that leads to life rather than to all this death. What if there had been a good shepherd to lead the flock in a different direction? If only there had been a prophet who could have told these people that if they live by the sword, if they will die by the sword. If they wage war as a means to live, they will find themselves receiving war and death in return. If only there had been a king of those Jews whose kingdom was not built upon military might or the worldly power. If there had been a king whose kingdom functioned differently and didn't engage uh, with Rome the way that Rome engaged with everyone else. Or if there was a priest, what if there had been a priest who taught the people how to worship God correctly as opposed to this corrupted temple system that colluded with the Roman Empire and the religious leaders found their power and got wealth and status and enriched themselves through this relationship with Rome? What if there had been a good priest who had, would have taught the people how to worship God correctly and they, they would have followed in the ways of God rather than in the ways of the world? And that is kind of the hook for today's message. Because Jesus is that good shepherd. He was that shepherd. He was that prophet, that priest, and that king that warned Jerusalem. He told them, your ungodly ways are going to lead to destruction. It's going to lead to death. There's no way around it. And so that's where our scripture story comes in from today. Um, this is a really difficult uh, scripture text if you just read it in and of itself. Um, there's some things happening here that aren't super clear. There's some allusions to uh, historical happenings that like happened in the life of, of Jesus um, like at the same time. But they don't go into all the details about it. So anyways, Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. They'll be on the screen or if you want to follow along in your Bibles. Um, and again, if you don't have a Bible, there's some scattered in the back of the chairs. Feel free to use that, but also feel free to take that home with you if you need one. Or you know somebody that needs a Bible, that's there for you. Uh, Luke chapter 13, verse 1 through 9. It says, Now there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig, on this fig tree, and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. I'll pray with me as well. Uh, Heavenly Father, wondrous spirit, Gather our minds that they may be one with you. 
Open our ears that we may hear your word. Soften our hearts that we may receive your wisdom. Speak to us, for we, your servants, are listening. Amen. Amen. So in this scripture story, there was two somewhat vague historical happenings. Two things that happened kind of, if, if there had been local news, if there had been social media, that would have been on the local news and the social media. Some things happened in the city that were significant, and uh, Jesus kind of talks to him. So before we get into what Jesus was trying to say, let's understand what's going on with these two events, because the, the gospel telling doesn't really give us a lot of details here. Uh, his audience would have known about it, though. So the first one is Pilate's mixing people's blood with their sacrifices. Right. So this would be something along the lines of Pilate or his guards uh, attacking, killing those who came to worship at the temple, right? Uh, but there's a, a, another layer happening behind this as well. So I mentioned a few moments ago the collusion between the temple and the government. Um, Pilate had some ambitious building projects that he wanted to do to make Jerusalem more impressive. This is what, what rulers wanted to do. They always wanted to leave a legacy to do something that would demonstrate their impressive nature to the world. And so he was doing some building projects. And those building projects cost money. And one of the most obvious places of funding was the temple treasury. The temple was loaded. People would come and bring their money, and they would come and they would give their offerings to God, and there was a tremendous amount of wealth in the temple. And so Pilate, as the one in charge, made the decision to start using some of these temple funds for his building projects. Now, the, the religious leaders really couldn't say no because there were consequences if they, they didn't go along with Pilate. Um, they would probably be removed from their positions, and somebody else would be put there that would go along. This is how power works, right? Um, and so there's these temple funds being used uh, for building projects, things like aqueducts that, that brought fresh water in from other places and moved it around the city and all those types of things. Um, and so there's these Galileans that were worshipers, but maybe even protesters. They might have been at, at the temple complaining, protesting against Pilate's use of these funds that way. Um, they were kind of unhappy that the people's offerings for God were being used by Pilate. Uh, and then the, separate, the second one is the Tower of Siloam falling, and history doesn't record much about it. There's no, like, you can't find on a map this is where the tower was. There's no description. Um, and this tower fell, though, and it killed 18 people. There's speculation. It could have been a guard tower. Maybe it was a tower that was built to, to protect maybe the water lines. Maybe it was to protect a vulnerable spot on the wall uh, in the city, something. But there, it could have been a guard tower. Um, or maybe it could have been a pillar for the aqueducts. If you, you've ever seen images of the aqueducts, they weren't, sometimes there were pipes in the ground, but a lot of times they were overhead, the water ran above you. Uh, water came down from higher places, mountains and that type of stuff, and ran down this grade, and they built these huge stone aqueducts. It's, it's amazing if you've ever seen any images of this. Maybe the tower was one of those aqueduct pillars. There's speculation by some scholars, and again, this isn't historically provable, you can't, go watch the video or something. Uh, but there's speculation by some scholars that those who were killed when the tower fell were workers that were working on the tower. And they were getting paid by Pilate through money taken from the temple. That's just some speculation. There's some indication that could be the possibility. Um, again, this all just kind of comes through the historical writings of Josephus and a few other folks. But uh, it's possible that the ones killed at the temple were killed for protesting against this abuse, and those that were killed when the tower fell were killed while doing this corrupt behavior or participating in this corrupt activity, being paid with money from the temple. Uh, so the crowd might have just been going up to Jesus going, hey, did you hear what happened? Um, you know, this tower fell over, or there were some people killed at the, at the temple. Oh, well, let's talk about it, you know. Um, that's a possibility, but more than likely, uh, they were seeking his response as a religious leader, right? He had a crowd. He'd been teaching and preaching. He had authority. He'd been doing miracles. Uh, he had followers. There were some that were looking for him to be this Messiah, this Messianic figure, to be this one that was going to kind of initiate this revolution 
against Rome. And so this crowd came to him and said, hey, did you hear what Pilate did? That's not acceptable, right? Like, you're not going to let that go. That, of all things, that warrants a response. Like, if you're waiting for an indication that you should start the war, that would be it. There's people that went to worship and Pilate killed them. Not only did he offend them, but he ruined the sacrifices. He messed up the temple system. Like, this crowd had had enough with Pilate and the Romans. We know that there's a lot of people in Jerusalem that wanted the Romans gone. They wanted this Messiah to come. They wanted to be free from the rule of Rome. There were some people that were campaigning for war. There were people that were actively working uh, against the Roman Empire. They thought that they could win. There's, there's some speculation that, that part of the reason why Judas eventually betrayed Jesus was because he thought that once Jesus got into the war that they were going to win. So that he wasn't actually betraying him, he was just kind of pushing Jesus into the spotlight. Because he thought when the soldiers came for Jesus that he would start the fight and take him out. That's just, again, speculation. But there was this attitude, this belief amongst a lot of people in Jerusalem that when the war would get started, we would win. So what are we waiting for? So this crowd came to Jesus saying, did you hear how bad things are getting? They're messing with the temple. They're messing with the worshipers. They're messing with the offering. They're messing with the sacrifices. Now is the time, right? God's on our side. We're going to win this. But Jesus hears this from the crowd and he turns it around on them. He says, those killed in the temple and those killed by the tower collapse do you think those were the worst of the worst? Were these sinners, like the, the scum of the earth, these are the worst people you could possibly imagine? Do you think God turned his back on them because they were terrible people? Do you think this was punishment for their sins? And more importantly, do you think you are better than them? Do you think that they died because they were awful sinners and God judged them, but you're better than them, so God will save you from the same fate? Jesus turns us around on them in a very blunt and direct, direct way. And then he goes into this teaching about the fig tree. <coughs> now, fig trees almost always represent either the temple, the, the priesthood in the temple, or the religious leaders uh, or the monarchy in Israel. So you see this fig image from time to time, but it's, it's almost always representative of the, the leadership in Israel, one way or the other. And so here's Jesus saying, well, there's this fig tree, and it's not producing fruit. We've got this temple, we've got this government, we've got this country, and it's not bearing fruit. The leadership is not leading us in the fruit that God has called us to. And so because it's not producing fruit, judgment is coming now in this parable, the, the, the destruction is delayed by a caretaker who says, let me, let me care for, for a little while longer. Let me see if I can get some fruit to come from this thing. I haven't given up on it yet. Like, destruction can come, but not today. Let's see if we can get some fruit from this victory. Let's not write everything off yet. But if it doesn't bear fruit, then you can cut it down. And so some 30 years after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. Some 30 years later, the Romans had had enough of this rebellious, uh, stubborn, protesting, difficult people in Israel, and they had enough of the religious practices that just made everything difficult. And so they invite the Jewish people into Jerusalem to worship for Passover, and then they declare war on that city and those who had gathered in it. Again, Josephus, this Jewish historian, he records that over a million people died as part of the siege of Jerusalem. A million people. The full weight of the Roman Empire came crashing down on Jerusalem, came crashing down on Israel. The city was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, the center of Judaism, and Israel was completely destroyed. And 30 years earlier, Jesus warned them that this was the direction things were going. This fig tree wasn't currently bearing fruit. He knew that it would have to start bearing fruit or it would be cut down. That it would have to start producing godly fruit or it's going to receive judgment. Israel and the temple needed to align itself with God again or it was doomed for destruction. 
And that was Jesus' response to this crowd that brought him the news of the death of these protesters, of these worshipers. He said, do you think you can rebel against the Romans? Do you think you can cause the same kind of disruption that they caused and not escape the same fate? Do you think that somehow they deserve this death? That somehow you would escape it? You're better than them? Do you think God punished them, but God will reward you for the same type of behavior? They wanted Jesus to react. They wanted him to judge Pilate and the Romans. They wanted him to condemn Pilate and the Romans and, and, and condemn the Jews that collaborated with them. They wanted Jesus to lead a revolution. Like, let's get this thing started. Let's get the war underway. Let's, let's start the fighting. God is on our side. We're going to do this thing. Jesus responds to them. He reacts to them. In some sense, he judges them. The scripture tells us that he said these words. You need to repent. Or you too will perish. Jesus calls them out in their desires, in their wishes, in their, in their will for fighting. For conflict. And whether it was, it was pride or arrogance, maybe they just believed that they were better. They thought they were good enough. Maybe it was vengeance. Maybe they thought, like, they had been wronged, and so God would be on their side as they tried to fix the wrongs of the past. Maybe it was ignorance. Maybe they just thought they could do this on their own. Whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, but Jesus calls them out. And he tells this crowd that came to him to invite him into to a war, to, into a rebellion, to, to a revolution, Jesus says, stop what you are doing and go another way. Did Jesus know what he was talking about? Knowing what we know happened in, in 65 through 70 AD, that, that the temple was destroyed, that Israel was com completely just leveled to the ground. It sounds like Jesus knew what he was talking about. If you keep doing what you're doing, the consequences are not going to be what you think they are. I mean, how many people died because the Jewish people continued down this path of rebellion, this path of violence and war with Rome? What did it cost them? Over a million lives, their city was destroyed, the temple knocked to the ground, and eventually all of Israel fell to the Roman army. Jesus said, repent, or you two will perish. They didn't repent, and they did perish. Now this is a phrase that, that growing up in the church, I heard often, and if you've been around the church for a while, you've probably heard that, that phrase, that, that quote from Jesus, repent, or you will perish, right? This is a, a favorite of uh, evangelists, right? A favorite of, for revival times, right? Repent, or you'll perish. Give your heart to Jesus, pray the prayer, confess Jesus as your Lord, and you'll go to heaven when you die rather than going to hell. And that's an important invitation, and if that's one that you have not heard or received, um, I'd be happy to talk with you about all the implications of that after service today. Um, I'm not trying to ignore that, but if we're going to take the scripture seriously, if we're going to take the Bible seriously, and let Jesus say what he was saying here, uh, we can realize that he wasn't specifically talking about heaven and hell and afterlife realities in this specific passage. It just wouldn't make sense in the context of the crowd coming to him and, and all of that. It, it, it was something that was much more present, physical realities. The first Sunday of Lent, I preached a sermon that said, Lent is a time for us to worship Jesus with our whole self. Not just with our mind, not just with our heart, not just with our spirits. But with our body, that's what I concluded with fasting. The fasting was worshiping God with our body, bringing our whole self in alignment before God. And in that sermon, I mentioned that our tendency is to move away from physical and move into more spiritual realms. To take things that may have been a physical reality and talk about them in, in a spiritual sense. It's just a temptation. We just have a tendency to, to move in that direction. We sometimes forget the physical element of the Christian life. And so repentance, as highlighted in this text, is a perfect example of that. Right? Christian culture, uh, if you go up to somebody and say, what does repentance mean? They're going to talk about repentance as getting your soul saved when you became a Christian. You know, 
confessing, confessing your sins and, get, and getting saved. You can, when did you get saved? When did you repent of your sin? That's kind of that, that realm there. And sometimes we confuse confession of sin with repentance. Just, they're connected, but they're not the same. There's a difference between saying, oh, I did something wrong, and saying, I'm never going to do that again, right? And choosing a different behavior and a different attitude and going down a different path. I know I'm a sinner, so I confess that. I tell God that I'm a sinner and I feel bad about it. That's confession. That's contrition. But it's not specifically repentance. And if you've been around the church for a while, you might have heard the word repent means to change your mind. I've probably preached that sermon before. Repentance means change your mind. And it does. But more importantly, more fundamentally, at its root, it means to turn around. Change your direction. Or change paths. So it's proper to understand repentance as one of the first steps of becoming a Christian. Uh, if you've ever made that decision to become a Christian, to give your life to Jesus, you've gone through the process of repentance. But it's not <clears throat> the only time that Christians <laughs> repent. Right? So we miss so much of the Christian life if we think it's something we only do that first day we're a Christian. Jesus tells his crowd to repent because the path they are on leads to destruction. Change your direction, turn around, go a different way, go a different path. Because the way you are going, the path you're on, is going to lead to death and destruction. Get on a different one. If you keep living in the world using the worldly ways of violence, of revenge, of hate, of war, you will find yourself on the receiving end of violence, hate, war, destruction, death. And this is not only a spiritual reality, but one that is lived out in everyday life. The way of God leads to life. The way of the world leads to death. These are fundamental Christian beliefs. And so for much of Christian history, repentance was not only the beginning of the life of Christ, but it was a daily part of the life of Christ. It was a regular practice and part of the Christian life. And if you haven't picked up on it already, I've alluded to it 19,000 times already, um, our spiritual practice for this week, the spiritual discipline this week, is repentance. Now, the early Christians in the early church, they didn't call themselves Christians. That wasn't the label they gave themselves. They called themselves people of the way. Or they just called themselves the way. And that was referring to Jesus. He says, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the life, right? So, the way of Jesus. They understood that the way of Jesus was narrow. They understood that the path that led away from Jesus was wide. They understood that the voice of God was small and quiet. You had to listen carefully to hear it. But they also understood that the voices that let, lead away from God are loud, sometimes clear, sometimes very tempting and alluring. They understood that even with our best efforts, you could wander off the path. Even if you've made up your mind, I'm going to follow this Jesus, your feet sometimes run a different direction. By the culture you're shaped in, by the instincts that you're shaped in, by the, the teachings of the society you're shaped in, you might wander away from the teachings of Jesus and wander outside the kingdom, whether deliberately or just on accident. They knew that without an ongoing commitment, an ongoing reevaluation of where they are, compared to where Jesus wants them to be. They knew that without that, they would wander off the path that Jesus laid out for them. And so for this early church and much of Christian history, confession and repentance was a regular part of faith and worship. It was an everyday part of service. Their service to, to Jesus. But here we are 2,000 years later, and repentance and confession don't seem to be as big of a deal in the Christian culture anymore. And maybe it's, it's because it isn't as necessary for Christians as it once was. I mean, is that possible? We just don't need to repent as much as we used to? Or maybe, maybe the voices of the world aren't as loud as they used to be. Maybe they're not as distracting as they used to be. The world's gotten quieter or is, is helping us be Christians. You know? Or maybe the way of Jesus isn't narrow anymore. Maybe after 2,000 years, the way of Jesus is now a super highway, and we can just kind of wander down and end up where we want to go. Or maybe humanity is inherently more godly. Maybe we just wake up in the morning closer to God than those 
I don't think any of things, those things are true, so it doesn't make me uncomfortable, it makes me uncomfortable just saying them. The conclusion I've come to is that repentance should be a consistent and regular part of our lives, just as it was for the early followers of Jesus. And so the invitation for today's message is to incorporate repentance into your everyday faith, into your regular life. But I don't want to leave it at that. Like it, I don't want to just come here and tell you, well, you need to repent more often. You need to confess sins more often. I don't want to leave it at that. I, I, before we move on, I want to talk about some of the barriers to living a life of repentance so that we can be aware of them and talk about them. We can see them at work in our lives. One of those barriers is this idea that God is in control and God is on my side, and so I must be doing okay. Right? It's, it's, as, a, as a kid, if you, you take something from the, the grocery store when nobody's looking and you don't get caught, you must think it's okay. <laughs> Nothing bad happened. Or, you know, you, you speed on the highway every day for a year and you never get pulled over for speeding. Like, it must be okay to speed. Right? And so you just think, well, God's on my side. God's in control of things. He's protecting me. I don't really have to worry too much about the consequences of my behaviors. I'm good. So that's one barrier. Another one is insecurity and what I call church peer pressure. There's so much anxiety and fear in Christian culture um, that if I raise my hand at, or come forward to the altar and say, you know what, I'm a sinner. The fear is that the, everybody else in the church will go, yeah, you are. There's this peer pressure to put your best foot forward, this insecurity, this fear that if I exposed my real self, if I told people what I'm really wrestling with, that they would not think that I belong here. That it would disqualify me from membership in the church. It would disqualify me from my, my positions of serving in the church. It would disqualify me from being a part of this body if people knew what I was wrestling with. So insecurity, this church peer pressure, it actually works against the very thing that Jesus calls us to do. Another barrier in, in this struggle of confession and repentance is this idea that those who suffer and meet destruction deserve it. That the bad people have got what they deserve and I'm doing better than they are, so I must be okay. It's a comparative way of analysis. Like, I'm doing better than they are, so I must be alright. Which is not how Jesus is ever evaluates people. Well, at least you're not as bad as the worst people. That's nothing Jesus ever said. Um, another barrier might be that we think confession and repentance is only something that we do when we want to become a Christian. It's how I become a Christian, not how I live as a Christian. Right? I, I repented when I was 13 years old. It was that church back in, in Illinois, and I went to the front pew, and my youth leader was there, and I was crying, and I repented of my sins, and checked it off my box. I did it once. I'm good, now I'm a Christian. And kind of tying in with that one, another barrier is this idea that's not been a part of our church or part of your faith life. So I don't even know how to incorporate this. Like, what would it look like for me to live a life of confession and repentance? So that's a barrier. Another one, and this is probably a big one in our culture today, is that life moves so fast that before we even have time to deal with the consequences of yesterday's shortcomings, yesterday's sin, yesterday's struggles, we're on to today's problems. And we can get distance from that problem that happened a week ago really quickly. We can get distance from that, that, that problem we had a year ago and think that it's settled in the back. When in reality, we've never worked through it. We've just moved, moved on, but it's still back there. So life moves so fast that we think we can just take the next step and not worry about what's going on behind us. But I want you to hear something. And this is, it's on the screen. This is the truth I want you to take away. Uh, today, the daily repentance, the ability to come before God on a regular basis and confess and repent is the result of a humbling realization that we have a tendency to abandon God and God's ways. And that might sound harsh, but it's a reality that I just want us to accept as a church. That given our own devices, given our own time, given our own experiences, we have a tendency to wander away from God. And if you can humbly accept that, if you can realize that that's who we are and that's what we, we will end up doing without careful attention, 
then the, the response of confession and repentance makes sense. Because then we can live in, in a, a life of repentance. We become uh, people who live with a pattern of life that consistently brings you back into faithful obedience to God. Right? So daily, weekly, whatever, like you are evaluating where you've been, where you're going, and how closely aligned you are with God. And you just come back. Come back to the right path. Come back to the way of Jesus. Come back to the, to the teachings, to the, to the mercies, to the way that Jesus taught his people to live. It's an invitation to come back. And so the invitation for us today is to include repentance as a regular part of our routines and prayer practices. And if we do that, it will reveal a humble and honest heart. It will it'll be transparent. It will be authentic. You will be humble before God. You will be honest with yourself, with God, and with others. Regular uh, repentance and confession opens us up to our own healing. If I have a, a, a tooth that's a problem and I'm unwilling to acknowledge that my tooth is a problem, I am never going to get that fixed. Right? I can't address it. The dentist can't fix it because the dentist doesn't even know about it. So being honest, confessing where our shortcomings are, opens us up for healing and growth. It also opens us up to grow in maturity, to understand that, hey, this is my weak spot. I either need to lean on God more there, I either need to spend more time myself figuring that out, or I need to learn to lean on the community more and let others help me in this weak spot. That's maturity as a Christian. And then it builds unity in our relationship. But if, if I'm able to go up to somebody and say, hey, I'm sorry I messed up. I'm sure that hurt you. I'm really sorry it won't happen again. You forgive me. That's a type of honesty and authenticity that we can have with each other if we're willing to acknowledge that, that we fell short. But when we Christians feel the pressure to, to always have it perfect, to always be right, to the fear of it, acknowledging that we've messed up, we can't ever have that conversation. What if people think we're not as good as they as we want them to? And so the first step into introducing this into our lives, to, to embracing this spiritual discipline, the first step is confession. Confession uh, has a, a unique place in the Nazarene Church. We're a holiness church. We have a doctrine of sanctification um, that says that the Spirit can work in the life of a Christian in such a way that we are completely transformed, that our lives are completely dedicated, turned over, consecrated to God, and the power of sin and death have no power over us. Like That's the, the definitive mark of a Nazarene holiness teaching, preaching church. Sanctification. But even within the Nazarene church, in one of our articles of faith, uh, number five, if you're curious, um, where it talks about sin, on one hand it talks about sin being a deliberate choice, like I'm just going to go and steal something today. And then it talks about this, I'm going to read the exact quote, uh, it says, it talks about sin and involuntary, inescapable shortcomings, infirmities, faults, mistakes, failures, and other deviations from a standard or perfect conduct that are the residual effects of the fall. Now what all of that means is you can deliberately choose to sin, or you might find yourself off the path just because you live in a world that's been corrupted by sin. You may find yourself, not by a choice of your own, not by your own will and desire, not by any corruption within your own soul, not because you chose to sin because you're a bad person. You might just find yourself a little bit farther away from Jesus than you thought you were. And either one of those two things is an invitation for confession and repentance. I'm not on the path that Jesus wants me on. How do I get back to that? And so as I was preparing the sermon on repentance, I really wanted to make sure I avoided the invitation to repent because of shame and guilt. Like, I didn't want you to make, well, you're a bunch of awful people, you need to get your act together. Like, I didn't want to do shame and guilt. I didn't want to do fear. Like, oh, if you don't do this, I mean, Jesus did enough of that. <laughs> you're going to perish. Like, I didn't want to do that. Like, you're going to burn if you don't get your act together. But rather, I wanted to use uh, kind of FOMO. You guys remember from Fear of Missing Out? Like, if you don't incorporate confession and repentance into your regular Christian life, it's not that you're going to be punished. You're just going to find yourself far away from Jesus and all the blessings that he wants you to have. You're going to find yourself missing out on the good things that Jesus has for you when you walk on the way that he's invited you to walk on. 
He's the good shepherd that wants his sheep to be cared for, that he teaches them to lie down in green pastures, he leads them to, to streams, he protects them, right? But if we wander off, we're missing out on that. So you can find yourself off the path, not because of your own choice or will, but simply by living in the corrupt world. So whether you chose to forsake the way of Jesus, or you just simply wake up one day and realize, I'm not where God wants me to be, confession and repentance is the tool to get you back to Jesus. And as Christians who agree that sin is a powerful reality that has corrupted creation, you know, that's kind of a starting point for us Christians. The creation has been corrupted by sin. We should be the quickest to admit that sin has an effect on our daily lives. We should be the most honest about the impacts of sin in our life, and we believe that. We should be the best prepared to confess and repent when we find ourselves wandering off the path. Let's read this, this prayer of confession together. Most merciful God, you can read that loud, sorry. Maybe you were, I just couldn't hear it. Pope Church was much louder than that, so if that's anything for you, like there was like 20 of them there, and anyways, we can't let Pope Church be louder. Okay, but let's try this again. Ready? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Now receive this assurance of pardon. And God is merciful to all who confess their sins and in humility ask for mercy. So it's in the name of Jesus Christ, that your sons, sins are forgiven. I invite you to stand and worship with our worship.